We had the chance to collaborate with both the Faculty of Business and Economics of the University of uh, Yozan and the think tank Forox, which is a think tank based in Switzerland and very active in any issues that has to deal with uh, foreign policy in Switzerland. So today, uh, I just would like first to say a few words about you think, about who we are, then I'll present the event, and then I'll let the floor to Professor Kerr. So you think, uh, one of the main goals of you think is to take scientific knowledge make and take it and make it available and accessible to the general public. Because too often it stagnates in the academic spheres and doesn't make it to the whole society. So today's seminar exactly fills this gap. Exactly try, is, is it's one example of how we try to fill this gap and to, to reach this goal. So immigration is a very debated topic. And nowadays, we hear in the news almost every day anything to do that has to do with immigration. Almost every day on the news we hear something. And especially uh, recently, many uh, right-wing uh, political movements have gained a lot of power. Uh, we see, in, for example, in the US with Donald Trump, or here in Switzerland with the SVP, or in, in France with the Front National, and many things are said. And often, these movements are really anti-immigration. So our approach, as you think, is to step back and just say, okay, but what do scientists have to say about that? What are the consequences of immigration for the native workers? Are wages affected? Are immigrants complements or substitutes to native workers? And to answer all these questions today, we have the pleasure to have with us Professor David Card. Well, professor Card is a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, in the United States. He is one of the, the most eminent labor economists, and he worked in most of the big topics in labor economics that have many interesting policy issues, for example, the minimum wage or immigration or health insurance. And today, Professor Card will talk about immigration. So now the talk will last approximately for 40 minutes. Then we'll leave for you like 10 or 20 minutes for your questions. And then we'll proceed with the, the we push the discussion outside with a glass of wine. So now I'd like to thank you and to ask you to welcome Professor David Carr. Uh, well, thanks very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, pleasure to be here. This is uh, the first uh, visit that my wife and I have uh, ever made to Switzerland, uh, believe it or not. Um, and weather was pretty nice today. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some cumulative research that I've worked on and others, uh, former students of mine and other people in the field have worked on over the last couple of decades on the labor market impacts of immigration. I, um, I should say maybe in, 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 uh, as an introduction that uh, many of the issues that come up in immigration uh, probably have relatively little to do with the <laughs> economics of immigration, have a lot more to do with other things that economists aren't really that good at understanding. I think in the issue and the, the aspects of the labor market impacts of immigration, however, we, we have a, a, a cumulative amount of evidence which suggests that we can at least contribute uh, to that side. And so that's what I'm going to focus on here. Um, so I'm going to try and talk about how immigration affects the level and structure of wages, particularly the level and structure of wages for natives. Uh, and I'm, uh, I was told that the audience is a, a group of uh, bachelor students and master's students, so I'm actually going to um, uh, rely a little bit on some economic theory, not, not too much, uh, to try and set the stage for this research. I think uh, this is an area where uh, economists have a com comparative advantage. Uh, in understanding maybe the way that, that we want to think about the labor market. So first thing I'm going to talk about is the importance of capital. Um, and uh, if you don't remember anything else about this lecture, uh, I, I would hope that you would remember the one important takeaway from this, which was Malthus was wrong. And I, I, want, to, I want to kind of come back and talk about what exactly the Malthusian view of immigration is. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, a, a related issue which is how we think you want to classify different workers. And this was the, in my introduction, he said, well, do we think of uh, immigrants and natives as complements or substitutes? And this is uh, related to that issue uh, in, in a, a variety of ways that I'll talk about. Then I'll talk about uh, another uh, related issue, which is how you define the labor market. Um, 
the labor market, if you actually speak to a person who's not uh, trained as an economist and say, you know, what's your labor market? They haven't really got any clue what you're talking about. This isn't really a, a thing. Uh, but there is a, a sense in which um, you can uh, empirically model the connection between different sets of workers and say, can we think of this market as different from that market and how uh, connected are they? And uh, that turns out to be pretty important in understanding some of the debate that's gone on in the immigration literature in the past. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about some evidence, including um, some evidence from a, uh, a thing that I've been working on recently. It's coming out in the Journal of Economic Literature. It's a review of a, um, a new book by George Borjas called Immigration Economics, in which uh, George kind of overviews uh, many of the same models I'll be talking about today and then presents some empirical evidence. And I'll give you a kind of my take, or Giovanni and my take, on, on how that evidence fits together uh, with, uh, with the overall question of immigration. Uh, so first of all, uh, in terms of theoretical foundations, the, um, the f what I would call the first order of fact, the main most important initial impact of immigration is to increase number of people in a labor market or a country. So either the population or the labor force, depending on how you think about that. And Malthus, of course, is famous for uh, modeling uh, the way that um, populations evolved. And his observation was that during the time of the Black Death in Europe, there was a massive reduction in population. And in the 150 or 200 years after the Black Death, real wages were quite a bit higher than they had been throughout the Middle Ages. So the, in a way, the Black Death was really good for workers. Um, and that led to, that's, that, that's this idea that um, there's a finite uh, set of resources that uh, workers can work with. In Malthus's uh, conceptualization, that was agricultural land. And uh, when uh, population is relatively low, you use the most productive land and productivity per worker is relatively high. Uh, and as you get more and more workers, your workers are pushed into uh, working with less good land. And at the end of the process, you're going to be in a situation where the last piece of land that you can cultivate is just productive enough to prevent starvation. So that's the Malthusian view. And is it, that's, there's some uh, element of that kind of view of human behavior that still permeates economics. It's a sort of a pretty negative view. You know, we're going to keep doing something until we can't do it any longer and we're starving to death. Um, now, we no longer think, most economists, I would say, no longer think of population as a horrible thing that's going to drive us all to ruination. And the reason why we think that is because of capital. So. Uh, Malthus was really thinking about a situation where the resources you could work with were fixed. There's nothing you could do to enhance that. Nowadays, we think of capital accumulation as the way that we've escaped the Malthusian trap. And I want to kind of go through how that works and how that's important in understanding immigration. And the reason why is because if you're listening to uh, a particularly a, um, a critic of immigration, normally what they'll th essentially say is something like this. Look, the economy has 100 jobs. Right now, we have 100 natives. They've all got a job. We bring in 10 immigrants. The 10 immigrants get 10 jobs. And then 10 natives become unemployed. That's, that's the Malthusian model of immigration. Right? There's a fixed number of jobs. This is what I call this a sociological model. Uh, so <laughs> I hope there's, this is not, actually most sociologists don't necessarily think this, but you know, if you're trying to you know, make a uh, kind of a uh, caricature of, a, of a, a model that has no economics in it, that would be the way to do it. Okay, so the way we think about it is different than that. And this is the way that the neoclassicals solve the growth problem. So a neoclassical growth model, it, it, we, we, you would learn in, math, in economics, is really this kind of model. So it says something like this. It says that the output you get is actually a function of both labor and capital. Okay, and the basic simplest possible model would be an exponential function, a Cobb-Douglas function, where you've got labor and capital. And most important for this, you have the assumption that if you double labor and you double capital, you double output. Okay, so you have constant returns to scale. And that's critical assumption. There's a lot of evidence that that's true. You can replicate what you're doing in uh, one part of the country in some other part of the country. 
if you can successfully replicate both the labor inputs and the capital inputs. And in this class of models, I'm going to think for the moment of L as a labor aggregate. So I'm not going to exactly say what, what it is, and we'll be talking about that in more detail uh, in, in just a minute. For example, labor aggregate, one simple labor aggregate is you add together the two groups of workers and you give them different weights. So I'm a PhD in economics, so I get a weight of 0.8. Someone else is a PhD in finance, they get a weight of 1.2, okay? <laughs> Maybe 1.5. Uh, a slightly different model is, uh, a more general model, is that the, the labor aggregate is some combination of L1 and L2. And we'll be talking about the kinds of combinations that are allowed. Now, in, that, in either case, the marginal product of labor, thinking of labor as a whole, in the Cobb-Douglas world, is a function that depends on the capital labor ratio. Right? It depends exactly on K over L. So if you have more capital per worker, workers are more productive. And if you have more capital per worker, capital is less productive. So that's exactly the idea. And that actually doesn't depend on the Cobb-Douglas uh, utility uh, production function. That only depends on constant returns to scale. So if that's the case, and you think that entrepreneurs can access capital markets and buy capital and they will continue to buy capital as long as the return on capital is equal to some interest rate that they or return that they, that they, uh, they don't actually affect the amount that they buy or sell doesn't affect. You have a situation where the entrepreneurs are going to keep investing in capital until the marginal return on capital is equal to that, that uh, return, that interest rate. And in that case what will happen is they will continue investing until K is proportional to L and some factor that depends on the interest rate. And the key observation here is when entrepreneurs can access capital at a fixed exogenous return, then if you double L, you'll double K. Right? And what that means then is that output is going to be linear in labor inputs. Because if I double L, entrepreneurs will invest in capital in double K, and then I'll be able to double output. Okay, that's the basic idea of the escape from the Malthusian trap. So it's not the case that if I have more workers, they become less productive. If I have more workers and I hold constant capital, they become less productive. That's the Malthusian idea. But if entrepreneurs can adjust and they have these economic incentives to adjust until they get a fixed outside return, then they're going to effectively increase capital proportionally. Okay? And that is the way that economists then think, most economists then think, that the, f the way that we adjust to increase population when uh, say an immigrant uh, flow comes to a country. So this is extremely important because if you don't have capital adjustment, then something like a 10% rise in population would be expected to cause average wages to fall by around 3%. The 3% comes from that's one minus labor share. Labor share is like 30, uh, 70%. So the, the first order effect in the absence of capital adjustment would be something like uh, every 10% is an increase in population is a 3% reduction in wages. But with capital adjustment, that all goes away. With capital adjustment, we can double the labor force and keep wages constant. Okay? Now, you might ask, well, is that just an assumption or is there any evidence on that? And I'm going to show you two pieces of evidence which suggest that this is actually true. I'm going to show you a simple trend graph of capital labor ratios in the United States over the period of the 1990s. And that's important because in the 1990s, the U.S. had the largest inflow of immigrants they'd had since the 1920s. Very large increases in immigration. And then I'm going to show you an even more ex extreme example. And it's the example of Israel after the fall of the uh, Soviet Union. There was a massive migration of uh, Jewish immigrants from uh, Russia to Israel. And it led to one of the largest mass migrations that we recorded in the 20th century. And I want to look at what happened to investment in Israel relative to other countries that are kind of similar. Okay? So this is the US data. This is the long run trend in capital per unit of labor. And you can see, that I didn't make this data up, it looks like I did, but I didn't. It's actually from the BLS website in the United States. Uh, you can see that there's an unbelievably smooth long run trend, okay, nice and linear. There's a lot of variation up and down. 
And so all through the 90s and 2000s, when we have this big increase in the labor force of the United States caused by migration, capital labor ratio doesn't fall. Capital labor ratio basically follows on trend. Okay, so it's not the case that all those Mexican migrants who Donald Trump wants to send back home caused a reduction in the capital per labor work, uh, per, per labor unit in, in the United States. It looks like, if anything, you know, things kept right on track. Now, this is an example from Israel. Now, this is a, there's two lines here. This is actually a, a, an analysis done by Ethan Lewis at Dartmouth College. So what did he do? Well, he's got data from the various international accounts, and he has data on investment. This is the investment over GDP ratio in Israel, this uh, solid line here. The migration starts occurring in 1990. So there's this mass migration uh, to Israel in 1990, 1991. And what he wants to do is say, well, you know, there's other reasons why uh, investment might change in the 1990s. So what, they, what he does is he finds a set of other countries and he constructs an average of the other countries such that they track Israel in this period here. Okay? And he says, that's how I'm going to define my comparison group and then I'll just follow that comparison group all through the next 15 years and see what happened in Israel. And as you can see, what happened in Israel was the increase in migration caused a massive increase in investment. Okay? This is like a 8 percentage points on a 20 percentage point basis. Okay? So almost a 40% uh, increase in investment rate in Israel immediately after that migration and continuing on for about 10 more years. And as a result of that uh, adjustment, the capital labor ratio in Israel uh, at the end of this whole episode was back where it was uh, on trend uh, in, in, in this episode. So even with these really sharp, now you can see it took five, eight years to do that, but it occurred, it began almost immediately. It's not like people waited around and said, oh my God, let's wait until wages really fall. <laughs> in fact, there's a kind of couple of interesting studies which show that the, this mass migration didn't cause wages to fall very much at all in Israel. So the investment opportunities were presented, investors then went out and, and did the investing. Okay, so from that I conclude that the first order effect of migration is, is really uh, mitigated by capital investment. Now second order effect of migration is distort the relative supply of different skill groups. Um, so you could imagine the migration flow to a certain country is not exactly the same as the existing workforce. And in that case, when we talk about this sort of doubling, we don't fully replicate. Suppose we say we're going to increase the, the supply of workers in a country by 25%, but we're going to end up increasing some skill groups by more than 25% and other skill groups by less than 25%, at least in some cases. And in that case, you might expect that that would have an effect on, on wages in the economy. Now, there's one case in which it doesn't, and that's this case here, the so-called efficiency, efficiency units model, where uh, we simply add together all the workers in the economy, but we give them weights equal to their relative efficiency. And that actually is kind of the go-to model. If you, if you really have no time and you've got to make a prediction, this would be the model I would use. Surprisingly, this, do, this model doesn't do too badly. So it, do, it says that relative wages don't depend on relative supplies, but you're going to increase the effective labor force. Now, a more sophisticated model is a model uh, along the lines that I've, I've written here, where you have, let's suppose, J different classifications of workers. So that could be a combination of education and language ability and experience in the labor market. So young worker with high education and multiple languages would be, you know, pretty good worker. An old worker with low education and not much uh, language ability in the new country would be uh, a lower skilled worker. Put them all together in, in a general class of models and one of the general class of models that economists use a lot is the so-called constant elasticity of substitution or CES model. That says the next line of the slide. It says that the relative wage of the two groups depends on their relative supply. And the parameter that governs the relationship is the inverse elasticity of substitution. So for instance, if I increase the relative supply of college educated, I'm going to use the American phrase for college educated. College educated means university and above, the way I'm going to say it. I, I, I can't that's the way we always say it in the U.S., even though I, that's not the way they say it in Canada where I'm from, but that's the way we always say it, and so I'm so used to that, I'm going to talk about college-educated workers. So college-educated means a bachelor's degree. Okay, everybody with me on that? Okay, so imagine I increase the supply of immigrants in a country, and they're relatively low-skilled, so the, the ratio of non-college to college workers goes up. 
What we would expect is there might be some increase in the wage of college workers because they're now in relatively short supply and a reduction in the relative wage of the non-college group. And the, and the uh, parameter that governs that relationship in a log linear form is called the inverse elasticity of substitution. And there's some evidence uh, that that's reasonable. And so quite a few different studies from the United States have suggested that there's at least two significantly separate groups in the labor force, the college group and everybody else. So in the everybody else group is pretty diverse. It includes people that have very, very low education, as well as people that just have a, a, a high school education, as well as people that have one or two years of university or technical college. So it puts that whole group in one big lump and puts everybody else with a bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD in another big lump and says, with those two lumps, I can get some kind of a relative demand and relative supply story. And that seems to be a reasonable uh, uh, assumption for the labor market. In the immigration context of the United States, I'm going to show you in just a second, if that's the right model, then immigration doesn't really affect relative wages because immigrants have about the same fraction of people with a university degree as the native population. Everyone thinks of immigrants in the United States as being, well, Donald Trump thinks of every immigrants in the United States as being uh, Mexican people with two years of education. But actually, if you were to look at my PhD students at Berkeley, 75% of them are foreign. Okay? If you look at Berkeley's undergrad student body, 30% of them are foreign. And if you look at all the people in the country with a bachelor's degree, it's not so different than the overall fraction of foreigners. So the basic the fraction of uh, immigrants in the United States who have a college degree is about the same as the fraction of natives. In other countries, immigrants are more skilled than the native population. I believe that's actually true in Switzerland. Uh, but I'll show you a graph for some other countries. The big issue in the United States is not the college, non-college. It's the low end versus the middle. And uh, the reason why is uh, on this graph, uh, this table here. Now, can everybody kind of see that, or is that too small? Want me to pass the glasses back? <laughs> How we, can you kind of see it? Okay. Okay, the 2020 vision people in the back have it. Have it. Okay. So this is a table. I don't really know why my table is so... On my screen here, it looks great. Here, it's a little low. Um, this is the average years of education, and I'm showing you all natives, column one, all immigrants, column two, Hispanic and non-Hispanic immigrants. So Hispanic means Mexican, Central American, South American. Technically, people from Spain are considered Hispanic, but uh, <laughs> there's almost none of them are migrating to the United States these days. They're all coming to Germany. Um, so you can see the average education in the U.S. of all natives is 13.7. Now, high school degree in the United States is 12. So this means a typical person in the U.S. labor force has 1.7 years of tertiary education beyond high school. Okay? And there's the distribution. 8% of natives, 7.9 exactly, have not high school. Dropout means you didn't finish high school. 31% are high school graduates. 29% have some college. 32% have a college or more. And amongst that college or more, 10% have an advanced degree. So one third of the people with college or more have a master's or PhD or MD or a law degree or something like that. If we look at the immigrant group, you can see the average years of education is a little bit lower. But at the high end, college or more, it's about 30%. And actually among the advanced degree, it's a tiny bit higher amongst the, the immigrants than the natives. Okay, so even though there's all those uh, low educated ones, you can see 30% of immigrants don't have a degree, uh, don't have a high school degree. And that is largely, in the next column you can see, that's largely comprised of Hispanics. 50% of Hispanic immigrants don't have a high school degree. In fact, many of them have only a few years of education and are actually not even literate. Uh, whereas if we look at the non-Hispanic immigrants, which are largely these days coming from Asia, you can see only 10% of those guys, very similar to the native population, I drop out, and 20% of them have an advanced degree. So this combination of these two groups here is giving rise to a group here that's fairly close to that group, at least in terms of the upper tail of the, uh, of the distribution. This is data showing, so, oh crap, showing similar uh, things for other countries. The top left panel is the United States, then the United Kingdom, then Canada, and then Sweden. The dark is immigrants and the uh, light is, um, is natives, okay? So in the United States, that's this one right here, 
That is the immigrant fraction. So non-college immigrants are a little bit more non-college than natives in the United States. This one is Britain. Now everybody knows Britain has a really poor, educated, old population. These days, young people in Britain are very likely to go to university. In the old days, it was a very poorly educated country. Immigrants, on the other hand, are very highly educated. So in, in, in Britain, immigrants are way, way more likely to have a college degree 80% have a college degree versus only 20% of natives. This is Canada, my home country. Uh, the immigrants are better educated than the native population. This is Sweden. Here, the immigrants are also, despite what you, you know, hear about Swedish refugee policy and so on, on average, the combination of immigrants is better educated than the natives. Then we go to France, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. This is data from a recent paper by Dokier, Osden, and Perry that looks at this data. So you can see, on average, in many, many countries, immigrants are better educated than natives. So if immigrants are doing anything in most of these countries, they're depressing the wages of highly skilled people. So this group here should be the ones that are most concerned about immigration because those darn immigrants are lowering our wages. Okay? Um, now, a, a, a related question. Uh, is whether inside of a given skill group, immigrants and natives are the same or different. And there's a, a, a fair amount of research which suggests that even when you classify by degree and age, immigrants and natives are, in fact, a little bit different. And one important reason for that is language ability. So especially at the lower end of the education distribution, many immigrants in a given category have much weaker language ability than the natives. And that puts them in a different set of jobs and means that they're imperfect substitutes for the natives. And that turns out to be pretty important uh, in discussing that. And I mentioned at the introduction another issue is the appropriate market. And the reason why that's important is because immigrants can come into a place and they might shift around the labor supply in that, uh, that labor market. But it's important when you think about that to think about, well, maybe immigrants come in and to some extent pre-existing immigrants or natives adjust to their presence by moving to other markets. And if that's true, it means we have to be a little bit careful. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the economic model of that labor market. It just means that when we add an immigrant to that labor market, the net increase in labor supply might be only 0.8. So here's how to think about it. The net uh, labor supply for skill group J consists of the number of natives N plus the number of immigrants M in that uh, skill group. And when I add an immigrant, I get a net increase of 1 plus whatever increase or decrease in the native population is induced by that presence of a new immigrant. And if you think that a DN, DM is like negative, that means an immigrant comes in, natives look around and say, oh my gosh, there's a lot of migrants in searching for jobs in my market. Maybe I'll go to another market. Maybe I'll move to Kansas, where there aren't very many immigrants. Now, I would recommend that if you're trying to maximize your wage, but that, if you want to get away from immigrants, that would be a way to do it. Uh, so, but if you can see, for as long as the derivative is greater than minus 1, in other words, the arrival of one immigrant doesn't cause one native to leave, as long as that's true, then immigration affects the total supply in that skill group, at least somewhat. And as long as you take account when one immigrant is equal to 0.8 additional workers, as long as you do that scaling correctly, you'll get the right answer. Okay. So what have we learned about all these issues? Well, on the skill group question, I think the research is pretty clear that the lowest end workers in the United States labor market, the dropouts, and the people in the middle, the high school graduates, are in fact perfect substitutes. That's a bit surprising, but I'm going to show you a graph to show that. The other thing that we've learned is that immigrants and natives with similar skill characteristics, except particularly at the bottom end of the distribution, are imperfect substitutes. Let me show you some evidence of the first question. This is a graph. And on the x-axis, in a log scale, is the increase, it's the arrival rate of dropout immigrants, so dro immigrants who don't have a high school degree, divided by those that have exactly a high school level education in a given city. And there's a 120 different major cities in the United States on the, in the plot points here. And so over here are cities where there's a lot, the immigrant inflow is highly, highly, highly dropout immigrants relative to the middle. 
So these are the places where the immigrants who are coming in are disproportionately composed of people with really low education relative to the middle group. Over here, it's the other way around. Right? So to give a characterization, this is like Miami, Los Angeles, El Paso, Texas, places like that. This is like Pittsburgh, uh, other places in the middle of the country where immigrants are on average pretty well educated. And on the x axis, y axis, I've got in each of those cities the relative ratio of wages for natives who have a dropout education versus a high school education. So if you thought that this uh, immigrant inflow was really forcing around relative wages, you'd expect a very systematic scatter here. And you can see, in fact, it's dead flat. Okay? And there's a lot of different evidence like that, suggesting that, surprisingly enough, different changes in the relative supply of people at the very bottom of the labor force relative to the middle do not affect wages for people at the bottom relative to the middle. Now, why is that important? It's important because, come back to this graph here, it means that that 30% of immigrants right there who are dropouts are competing with a much broader group. They're competing with this entire group here. All those people in the middle and bottom. Okay, so you're diffusing the impact of that dropout intensive inflow of immigrants across a much wider range of people in the uh, labor force. The other thing we've learned is that immigrants and natives with similar education are uh, imperfect substitutes. Here's another graph. Here we have the relative supply in, in a given city of natives over immigrants. And I've divided workers in this category. I focused in this uh, graph on workers in the bottom quartile of predicted wage distribution. So that's low educated, not very much experience uh, kind of workers. And you can see on the x-axis, I've got the relative wage of natives divided by immigrants. And you can see as I increase the relative supply of natives to immigrants, I lower the relative wage. So there's a pretty systematic uh, negative pattern there. And that's exactly this inverse elasticity of, of uh, substitution. It's not a huge elasticity. It's a number like uh, 10 or 20. So it says that there's a degree of imperfect comp uh, substitutability between those two groups. Okay. On the issue of local versus national markets, there's quite a bit of confusion in the literature because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, some people think that when immigrants come in, a lot of natives move away. Other people think that uh, migration reaction is small. Uh, and I'm going to argue, and I'll show you why I argue that in a couple of seconds, that in fact, the net migration responses are in fact very small. And as a result of that, when you look at the local market or you look at the uh, city level or state level or national level in the United States, you get more or less the same answer. So it's not the case that you get different answers looking at different levels of aggregation in the labor market. OK. So to do that, I'm going to preview some evidence from a paper that I mentioned at the beginning. It's coming out. It's a review of this book by George Borjas, Immigration Economics. I recommend the book to anyone that wants to work on immigration uh, topics and, and from a fairly technical level. It's got a lot of uh, algebra. It's got a lot of graphs in it. It does, however, have a very negative view of immigration. Uh, George is well known as a, a very skeptical of immigration and someone who believes that the immigration is bad for the U.S. economy and is hurting U.S. workers. And Giovanni and I, I think, we're, would be viewed as people who are much more uh, positive about immigration. And so we got the data that he used in his book, and we thought about why some of the uh, results that he's showing seem to suggest uh, responses that are different than what we think makes sense. And it turns out that the key conceptual issue, and this is a very subtle point, it's almost too subtle to explain to a general audience. But it turns out it matters quite a bit. And it turns, th the question is this, do we look at immigrant inflows, or do we look at the fraction of immigrants in a city at a, or state or at the country at a point in time. So do we look at how immigrants are coming in or do we look at their relative share of the total population? And to, to, to just make a clear explanation of why that's important, I'm going to have to do some somewhat advanced algebra, okay? Derivatives. Everybody ready for that? <laughs> We're no integrals, just derivatives. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Giovanni and I think and theoretical models that George writes down in his book and everybody thinks about 
suggests that the way you're thinking about an economy when immigrants come in is you're thinking about this quantity here. You're thinking about the incremental change in the number of workers as a fraction of the people who were in that skill category initially. So the denominator here is the, oh, the denominator here is L I T minus uh, t, t minus 10. I'm using T minus 10 because the data is going to come from 10 year census data. Okay? So this is the number of workers. L, remember L is the total number, M is the number of immigrants, N is the number of natives. L is equal to M plus N. So in the denominator I've got the total number of people in a given skill group 10 years ago. And on the uh, numerator I've got the inflow of new immigrants in that skill group. And that is the variable that we believe is appropriate for measuring the pressure that's put on a labor market in a given skill group by immigration. What George does is look at this number. He looks at the number of immigrants divided by the, the total labor force in this period. Okay? So M divided by L is just the immigrant intensity of that skill group today. And it's pretty easy to show that the change in P, the change in immigrant intensity, reflects two things. The first is the thing that we think is important, it's the arrival of immigrants. The other is an offsetting change in the number of natives. And so when you run uh, statistical analyses using this variable, you're actually getting a combination of immigrant changes and native changes in the same skill category. Now why does that matter? Well obviously it matters for studying mobility because in mobility analysis what I'm doing is I'm looking at how the change in the native population is related to the change in immigrants in the same skill category and if the variable that I'm thinking as a uh, explanatory variable is delta P it's negatively correlated by construction. Okay, so if you use this analysis you're going to find that very large apparent response of natives to immigrants, but it's a, what I would call a denominator effect. Because we're really isolating this component here rather than that component there. Okay, I'm going to show you how that matters in just a second. The other thing, and this is a little bit more subtle, is a lot of cities in the United States are rising or falling over time with, with demand shocks from all kinds of different sources. For instance, I live in Bay Area and San Francisco area. We've got uh, almost Swiss-like demand shock going on. I mean, prices are really crazy, traffic jams, everybody can get a job if you can walk and talk and uh, brush your teeth, okay? Actually, if you can walk, talk, brush your teeth and, and comb your hair, you can probably get a really good job. Uh, so there, we've got a really big demand shock, but there's lots of other places that have really negative demand shocks. So lots of the center of the country, the part of the country that's probably going to vote for Mr. Trump in the next election, is pretty depressed. And those places, they're kind of like France. Okay, those places are really in trouble. And what's going on? Well, all the people from those places are moving to San Francisco just like all French people are moving to Switzerland, right? So exactly what you'd expect. And that's going to give you a bias because when you look at what's going on in Switzerland, you say, well, there's all these migrants coming in. But in fact, there's also you know, lots of natives moving to Geneva or moving to Zurich from inside of Switzerland. So there's a kind of a correlated movement that's uh, possibly screwing up the correlations. Okay, so let's take a look at how this matters. So what we're doing here is we're doing statistical analysis. Uh, this is the thing that labor economists love to do. I'm a labor economist. We love to do what's called running regressions. That's really what we do. We run regressions. Okay, so we're running regressions. We're relating... Uh, the dependent variable here is a native migration flow, and there's different kinds of native migration flow. This is the inflow of people, natives, to a given city here or state here. So column here, that's the number of natives in a given skill group who've moved in to a city, divided by the size of the number of people in that skill category in that city 10 years ago. This is the same thing for the state. And you can see in the cop column, this is the numbers that uh, George uh, Boras reports in, in one of the in key tables of his book. He says, well, look, if you look at the city flows, you say when, there's a, when you've got an increase in mig migrant share, okay, so that's P, when that's higher, you get a big reduction in uh, net native migration, minus 0.6. Now remember, minus 0.1 means every immigrant that comes in 
is reducing the, the number of, is inducing one person to leave. So this says every immigrant that comes in, 0.66 natives leave. Now, when you think about that and think about places like San Francisco or Los Angeles, say that can't possibly be true because there's so many people living here that, you know, it, didn't, it just doesn't add up. There's way too much, this is in, implying way too much out migration of natives. And you can see the reason why that's coming about. If we switch to our specification, what we think makes sense, then in fact there's a small offsetting effect. When you, at the city level, when you have uh, one extra immigrant, we're going to get minus a half, minus 0.05 natives move out and we're uh, here and we're going to get minus 0.05 fewer natives moving into the city from other places. So on average, every immigrant in a skill category is going to lead to 0.9 extra people in that category. So almost, there's a little bit of reaction of natives, nothing like 66, it's minus 0.1. Similarly, at the state level, instead of 32 offset, it's only in 7 offset. So this is a completely trivial uh, issue. It's nothing to do with economics. It's entirely to do with the specification of the econometric model. Same thing is true when we look at wages. So now we're looking at the effect of immigration on native male wages. And one of the points that Boras makes in his book, and the relative ratio of wages for natives who have a dropout education versus a high school education. So if you thought that this uh, immigrant inflow was really forcing around relative wages, you'd expect a very systematic scatter here. And you can see, in fact, it's dead flat. Okay? And there's a lot of different evidence like that, suggesting that, surprisingly enough, different changes in the relative supply of people at the very bottom of the labor force relative to the middle do not affect wages for people at the bottom relative to the middle. Now why is that important? It's important because, come back to this graph here, it means that that 30% of immigrants right there who are dropouts are competing with a much broader group. They're competing with this entire group here. All those people in the middle and bottom. Okay, so you're diffusing the impact of that dropout intensive inflow of immigrants across a much wider range of people in the uh, labor force. The other thing we've learned is that immigrants and natives with similar education are uh, imperfect substitutes. Here's another graph. Here we have the relative supply in, in a given city of natives over immigrants and I've divided workers in this category, I focused in this uh, graph on workers in the bottom quartile of predicted wage distribution. So that's low educated, not very much experience uh, kind of workers. And you can see on the x-axis I've got the relative wage of natives divided by immigrants. And you can see as I increase the relative supply of natives to immigrants, I lower the relative wage. So there's a pretty systematic uh, negative pattern there and that's exactly this inverse elasticity of, of uh, substitution. It's not a huge elasticity, it's a number like uh, 10 or 20. So it says that there's a degree of imperfect comp, uh, substitutability between those two groups. Okay, on the issue of local versus national markets, there's quite a bit of confusion in the literature because, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, some people think that when immigrants come in, a lot of natives move away. Other people think that uh, migration reaction is small. Uh, and I'm going to argue, and I'll show you why I argue that in a couple of seconds, that in fact, the net migration responses are in fact very small. And as a result of that, when you look at the local market or you look at the uh, city level or state level or national level in the United States, you get more or less the same answer. So it's not the case that you get different answers looking at different levels of aggregation in the labor market. Okay. So to do that, I'm going to preview some evidence from a paper that I mentioned at the beginning. It's coming out. It's a review of this book by George Borjas, Immigration Economics. I recommend the book to anyone that wants to work on immigration uh, topics and, and from a fairly technical level. It's got a lot of uh, algebra. It's got a lot of graphs in it. It does, however, have a very negative view of immigration. Uh, George is well known as a, a very skeptical of immigration and someone who believes that the immigration is bad for the U.S. economy and is hurting U.S. workers. And Giovanni and I, I think, would be viewed as people who are much more uh, positive about immigration. And so we got the data that he used in his book, and we thought about why 
some of the uh, results that he's showing seem to suggest uh, responses that are different than what we think makes sense. And it turns out that the key conceptual issue, and this is a very subtle point, it's almost too subtle to explain to a general audience. But it turns out it matters quite a bit. And it turn, the, the question is this, do we look at immigrant inflows or do we look at the fraction of immigrants in a city at a, or state or at the country at a point in time? So do we look at how immigrants are coming in or do we look at their relative share of the total population? And to, to, to just make a clear explanation of why that's important, I'm going to have to do some somewhat advanced algebra, okay? Derivatives. Everybody ready for that? <laughs> We're no integrals, just derivatives. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Giovanni and I think, and theoretical models that George writes down in his book and everybody thinks about, suggest that the way you're thinking about an economy when immigrants come in is you're thinking about this quantity here. You're thinking about the incremental change in the number of workers as a fraction of the people who were in that skill category initially. So the denominator here is, the, oh, the denominator here is L I T minus, T, T minus 10. I'm using T minus 10 because the data is going to come from 10 year census data. Okay? So this is the number of workers. L, remember L is the total number, M is the number of immigrants, N is the number of natives. L is equal to M plus N. So in the denominator I've got the total number of people in a given skill group 10 years ago. And on the uh, numerator I've got the inflow of new immigrants in that skill group. And that is the variable that we believe is appropriate for measuring the pressure that's put on a labor market in a given skill group by immigration. What George does is look at this number. He looks at the number of immigrants divided by the, the total labor force in this period. Okay. So M divided by L is just the immigrant intensity of that skill group today. And it's pretty easy to show that the change in P, the change in immigrant intensity, reflects two things. The first is the thing that we think is important, it's the arrival of immigrants. The other is an offsetting change in the number of natives. And so when you run uh, statistical analyses using this variable, you're actually getting a combination of immigrant changes and native changes in the same skill category. Now why does that matter? Well obviously it matters for studying mobility because in mobility analysis what I'm doing is I'm looking at how the change in the native population is related to the change in immigrants in the same skill category. And if the variable that I'm thinking as a uh, explanatory variable is delta P, it's negatively correlated by construction. Okay, so if you use this analysis you're going to find that very large apparent response of natives to immigrants, but it's a, what I would call a denominator effect. Because we're really isolating this component here rather than that component there. Okay, I'm going to show you how that matters in just a second. The other thing, and this is a little bit more subtle, is a lot of cities in the United States are rising or falling over time with, with demand shocks from all kinds of different sources. For instance, I live in Bay Area and San Francisco area. We've got uh, almost Swiss-like demand shock going on. I mean, prices are really crazy, traffic jams, everybody can get a job if you can walk and talk and uh, brush your teeth, okay? Actually, if you can walk, talk, brush your teeth and, and comb your hair, you can probably get a really good job. Uh, so there, we've got a really big demand shock, but there's lots of other places that have really negative demand shocks. So lots of the center of the country, the part of the country that's probably going to vote for Mr. Trump in the next election, is pretty depressed. And those places, they're kind of like France. Okay, those places are really in trouble. And what's going on? Well, all the people from those places are moving to San Francisco just like all French people are moving to Switzerland, right? So exactly what you'd expect. And that's going to give you a bias because when you look at what's going on in Switzerland, you say, well, there's all these migrants coming in. But in fact, there's also you know, lots of natives moving to Geneva or moving to Zurich from inside of Switzerland. So there's a kind of a correlated movement that's uh, possibly screwing up the correlations. Okay, so let's take a look at how this matters. So what we're doing here is we're doing statistical analysis 
uh, this is the thing that labor economists love to do. I'm a labor economist. We love to do what's called running regressions. That's really what we do. We run regressions. Okay, so we're running regressions. We're relating uh, the dependent variable here is a native migration flow, and there's different kinds of native migration flow. This is the inflow of people, natives, to a given city here or state here. So column here, that's the number of natives in a given skill group who've moved in to a city divided by the size of the number of people in that skill category in that city 10 years ago. This is the same thing for the state. And you can see in the cop column, this is the numbers that uh, George uh, Boras reports in, in one of the in key tables of his book. He says, well, look, if you look at the city flows, you say when, there's a, when you've got an increase in mig migrant share, okay, so that's P, when that's higher, you get a big reduction in uh, net native migration. Minus 0.6. Now remember, minus 0.1 means every immigrant that comes in is reducing the number, of, is inducing one person to leave. So this says every immigrant that comes in, 0.66 natives leave. Now, when you think about that and think about places like San Francisco or Los Angeles, say that can't possibly be true because there's so many people living here that, you know, it, didn't, it just doesn't add up. There's way too much, this is in, implying way too much out migration of natives. And you can see the reason why that's coming about if we switch to our specification, what we think makes sense, then in fact there's a small offsetting effect. When you, at the city level, when you have uh, one extra immigrant, we're going to get minus a half, minus 0.05 natives move out and we're, uh, here, and we're going to get minus 0.05 fewer natives moving into the city from other places. So on average, every immigrant in a skill category is going to lead to 0.9 extra people in that category. So almost, there's a little bit of reaction of natives, nothing like 66, it's minus 0.1. Similarly at the state level, instead of 32 offset, it's only in 7 offset. So this is a completely trivial uh, issue. It's nothing to do with economics, it's entirely to do with the specification of the econometric model. Same thing is true when we look at wages. So now we're looking at the effect of immigration on native male wages and one of the points that Boras makes in his book and that lots of people have made in, in earlier studies, he in particular, is that you find very little evidence when you look across cities that the higher immigrant share is correlated with lower uh, native wages. But when you look at state, it's a little bit stronger. When you look at census, it's a little bit stronger. And at the national level, it's quite strong. This is a very large negative effect. It says if you have 10% extra immigrants in a, in a skill group, their wages are 5% lower. That's a really large negative effect. That's larger than a pure Malthusian. Remember, the pure Malthusian would be minus 30. So that's too large to be believed. And it's all arising because of the incorrect specification. It's all arising because of a, a, a spurious correlation between whether natives in a particular skill group are supplying their labor or not that's correlated with the arrival of immigrants in that skill group. So when we switch to the preferred specification down here, you can see on average all of that goes away. There's not much evidence at all across city, state, census division, or at, even at the national level that immigration causes a, a reduction in wages. So my conclusion from that is that at any level you look at, the effects of immigration on native migration and native wages are small. Finally, however, we could look at a series of simulations, and this is the last thing I'm going to show. This is a, a way that uh, uh, George Boras and others, including Giovanni, Perry, and uh, lots and lots of other analysts have tried to summarize a complete set of simulation models. So these are complicated simulation models in which you're allowing different degrees of substitution between different groups, and you're focusing uh, on, in particular, uh, five education groups, dropouts, high school graduates, some college, bachelors, and postgraduates. The last column is, of course, most interesting in some respects. That's all natives together. And this is a simulation where we say what's happened as a result of all the immigrants that came into the United States between 1990 and 2010. Now, just to rem remind you, that was 20 years of massive inflows relative to any historical pattern in the U.S. since the 1920s. Uh, you know, not as big as the immigrant inflows into some European countries in, the, in, the, in that same period as a proportion of the population, but quite large. And the first row is a 
is the specification directly from Borhaus's book, and this is his preferred specification. So this is the specification that George would kind of point to as evidence that immigration is hurting natives. And you can see, after you adjust for capital, there's no average effect. Okay, that's because, remember, if you adjust for capital, capital per worker stays constant, so the average wage of all workers is unaffected. But it does have a relative effect, and it's particularly glaring negative effect on the dropout group. Because remember, the immigrant group are the very highly intensive in dropouts in the United States. It's a little bit positive for some other groups, and again negative at the, B, at the postgraduate level. And again, we saw some reason why that's true, because immigrants are kind of at the extremes. A lot of immigrants are really below education, and a lot of immigrants are really high. So the two losers, according to this analysis, are the dropouts and the postgraduates. Now in row two, we drop the assumption that we change the assumption that high school graduates and dropouts are imperfect substitutes, and we make the case that they're perfect substitutes. Remember, I, I was arguing that that's what the data suggests. And when you do that analysis, you can see these effects become very, very small. And the reason why is because this minus 0.3 on the dropouts, in combination with the plus 0.4 for the high school graduates, gets diffused across both groups and becomes a minus 0.2 under that assumption. Okay. A second possible permutation would be to allow natives and immigrants in a given skill group to be imperfect substitutes. Remember, we saw some evidence of that, this negative correlation. And so if we do that, again, that mitigates the effects. There's still a slightly negative effect on dropouts. But on average now, immigration is actually helping natives. This is the complementarity result. Because with, with a little bit of imperfect substitution between natives and immigrants in each skill group, on average, immigrants then become complements with natives when you can allow capital to adjust. And then finally, this is the specification that Giovanni and I think makes most sense. This is the model where we have both uh, pool together all workers at the bottom and think of them as one big lump. We think that's justified by the data. And allow a little bit of imperfect substitution between natives and immigrants. Not much. The, this elasticity of substitution of 20 is a very large elasticity. It means they're almost perfect substitutes. Introduce those two and you can see virtually every group wins. The average effect in the economy is slightly positive. The only losers after that's all done are the uh, postgraduates. And that effect is very, very small. So we can see that the kind of debate in the US literature about what immigration does really revolves around numbers like minus 3 versus positive 1. Okay, all of that immigration that occurred in those 20 years, the kind of the worst case scenario you can put together is it lowered dropout wages by 3%. Now by reference, in that 20 year period, dropouts real wages fell by about 15 percentage points. Okay, so this would be, you know, about a fifth of that if you thought that there was, that this was the, uh, the if you agreed with that first row. If you agree with uh, Giovanni in mind, you say, well, on average, immigration really didn't do anything to anybody's relative wages. So in some sense, the whole debate is pointless because we're really talking about tiny numbers. The, you know, the strongest rational critic of immigration puts together the best case in the top row, and that's not really a strong case. Two crazy guys like Giovanni and I, people who, you know, we're both immigrants, we think immigration is great, whatever. Uh, by the way, George is an immigrant too. Uh, <laughs> We put together the strongest positive case we can, and we get zero. So in some sense, the economic impacts of immigration on native wages is a non-issue in the United States. And when you think about other countries, now just remind yourself of this graph. Okay, in most of these other countries, immigration is probably increasing the high skill group relative to the low skill group. So on average, if anything, it's probably reducing wages of highly educated people a little bit. Okay. Now, there's a reason not to worry about that much, which is none of this analysis takes account of the fact that probably highly educated people have some spillovers and externalities. Economies with lots of highly educated people do better for reasons we don't fully understand but are really not built into any of the models I've written down here. So if you allow for a little bit of that, you probably wouldn't be too worried about having lots more college educated people. Okay. So uh, my conclusion from all of this is here, that once you allow for a little bit of uh, uh, imperfect substitutability between natives and immigrants, then immigration has small effects, slightly positive on average wages. And moreover, however you look at the evidence, look at the city level, look at the state level, 
look at the national level, you get more or less the same answer. Okay, so I'm going to stop with that and have time for questions. Forty minutes. <laughs> I was talking extremely fast. Uh, I could talk about that. The evidence on that is uh, that, in fact, recent migrants are most competitive with other recent migrants. So, of course, there's probably going in any economic model, all of the negative effects are going to be concentrated there. Yes. So that that's true. Um, whether other migrants are the main negative force against, you know allowing additional migrants? I, I, I'm not really sure. That's definitely not the case in the United States. Yeah, yeah. but like maybe other countries. Immigrants are the of the I mean, natives that are uh, second generations are the fraction. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Could be true. Um, I have probably a pretty main question. My background is in biology, so I'm okay. But um, I was wondering if you also looked at it the other way around. So, what's the impact of immigration uh, to the country where the people leave from? Uh, For example, uh, Poland, I think there's a lot of uh, immigrants who left to work in other countries in the European Union. Yep. Um, uh, there is, yeah, Giovanni has written a couple papers on that. Um, so, uh, depending on the country, immigration in some countries is causing some of the most highly skilled people to leave. A classic example would be nurses leaving South Africa, for example. Uh, and, and some of the critics of migration will point to things like that and say, well, we're, we're losing some of the most highly skilled workers from these cities, from these countries. So uh, it's a little bit hard. There's often not very good data on those countries. Giovanni has studied migration from uh, Eastern European countries to, uh, like, like Poland, to the other, to other European countries. My recollection is that he finds uh, some effect on that, but not huge. These kind of models are often going to say that if you take people away from the Polish labor market, it's going to make the remaining Poles better off. Because they don't build into them this idea that it's actually good for an economy to have highly skilled workers. Right? These are pure models where everybody's just competing with everybody else. There's no spillover effects from having highly educated workers. If you, and trying to evaluate that, that side of the story is very difficult. So probably Poland has lost a good chunk of the high university educated people in the country. And Hungary and other countries like that are, have done the same, Romania and so on have done the same thing. That might be hurting those economies more than we think. But this kind of analysis will say on average, it's good for the other natives who remain for those people to leave because less competition. I don't think that's the total answer, but that's what they will say. Yeah. But I think his answer is it's pretty small effects. Yeah. yeah. Like um, order of magnitude of these numbers. One, three, five percent, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is your view or what is uh, some evidence in the literature on the impact of the welfare systems? I mean, looking at Europe, especially on mobility of people, I mean, uh, in the view of that 
sometimes it might be more beneficial to move to actually get a new job, but kind of like the welfare system reducing the will to do so or to to still have like the similar benefits or to take the additional cost of the move into account to move somewhere else. And um, you're thinking about that in terms of the migrants who are reacting to no, the benefits or the natives? In general, like, I see. I mean, on natives and migrants, like in everyone. Else. Yeah, okay, so one, one interesting phenomenon that's occurring around the world is that young people are becoming much less mobile in virtually every country that anybody studied. In the United States, there's a very large negative trend in mobility rates. And people have become aware of that and think that it might be. It's hard to explain why that's occurring in the United States as a result of the welfare state, because we, we don't really have a welfare state, for, certainly not for young people uh, very, very much. So it, but probably one explanation, and there's, there's a few economic, academic papers which have studied this, is that in the absence of a welfare state, if you're a, a young worker facing economic uncertainty, your safety net is your parents. So the, present, the, the absence of a welfare state means that you're geographically tied to wherever your parents are because that's where you can get free rent and dinner if you can't really afford to you know, get a job. So um, it's possible that, that that's an explanation is that you know, when you've got too little welfare state, too, too little a safety net, it creates too much risk to move to a new place and try out. Now, on the other hand, the age of mass migration in the 1880s and 1890s, there was no safety net and people moved all over the place. And people moved from southern Italy to northern Italy in the 1940s and 1950s without much of a welfare state. So people apparently used to be willing to take a chance and uh, you know, struggle and survive uh, even in the absence of that you know, mom's home cooking and ironing your laundry. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't exactly know. It's, it's, it's actually an emerging puzzle in many, many countries. It's not just, uh, you know, the welfare state countries, it's other countries as well. Yeah? I know it is an issue, but the immigrants' degrees are sometimes not valid in the, in the camp that they yeah. go to. Yeah. You have a nurse from Poland who comes to Switzerland and the degree is not valid. You cannot work as a nurse, but as an aid nurse, I don't know, a lawyer, I don't know. Kind yes. Of. Yes. So some people think that that's a huge problem. Uh, other people think it's less of a problem. Um, probably to the extent it's an issue, it's more of an issue in the countries like Switzerland and Germany that have these rigid apprenticeship systems with certificates that uh, very precisely delineate the qualifications. You've got to remember in the United States almost nobody has qualifications for anything. <laughs> it's a reason why I think that there's imperfect substitution between immigrants and natives. And it's the reason why, as a result of that, that most of the effect of migration is probably on other migrants. It's a combination of language ability and certificates. Now, in terms of uh, you know, longer run adaptation, for instance, the Philippines is a major source of nurses to the United States. And how do they do that? Well, the nursing schools in the Philippines set it up in such a way that the students qualify when they come to the U.S. They automatically meet the U.S. standards. And the same with medical schools in Granada and other places like that. So there, there are, in situations where there's massive flows, presumably institutions can adjust to try and say, okay, we're going to pre-qualify our people so when they get there, it's no problem. Now, so for example, a good example would be plumbers from Poland. If you're a plumber from Poland and you move to England, you're a super qualified relative of an English plumber, right? And everybody wants to hire you. And I, I happen to know a few friends in London who are dying to hire you right now. <laughs> if you go to Germany, you're not very qualified relative to a German guy. So the Polish guy wants to move to London because he's, you know, a Polish plumber is way better off there. And I think that's one reason why uh, migrants from Poland and those countries are often thinking about going to the Anglo countries, which are a bit more flexible. Yeah. Very non-technical question about what could be done. So, because so what we didn't have a chance to discuss is uh, the one group that is highly affected by migration are the people who migrate. Uh, this guy is a huge case yeah. for the global perspective of migration. And so, what, what can we do actually? So, when we have potentially a huge game for the world, and we have some reluctant Trump supporters, and uh, maybe a basic one on one advice would be tax the guys who win 
transfer it to the pseudo losers, the guys who are scared at least? I don't know. Do you have any anything? Um, well, uh, you know, I um, uh, never give policy advice, actually. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Um, <laughs> that's worked out pretty well for me. Otherwise, I'd have been killed many years ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there is, there are papers, a, a number of papers by uh, economists on both sides of the political spectrum suggesting that one thing a rich countries could do is uh, sell visas. Now, that's obviously attractive for highly skilled workers. For low skilled workers, it's an issue. On the other hand, employers in the United States, for instance, lots of agricultural employers, effectively are subsidizing uh, workers by, you know, they're basically paying for their visas. Right? So there's all kinds of temporary programs to bring agricultural workers in. So you could imagine a situation where you say, if you want to have a low-skilled worker, then you have to do some kind of a, a payment to the, the economy. Uh, I don't see that coming. It, it's because it strikes almost everybody except an economist is extremely unfair and arbitrary. I don't see it ever happening. But it's been on the table many, many times. Um, another way to think about it, in many, many countries, especially the Anglo countries, the main mechanism we have for high-skilled workers is you come to that country and get a university degree. So the, main, the universities are benefiting from this. So from China, for example, they want to move to the United States. It's almost impossible to get a visa. However, if you come to the United States and get a bachelor's degree, you can then enter into the H-1B pool. So the universities are effectively selling the degree, uh, selling the visa. So they're coming, they pay their tuition to Berkeley, $30,000 a year for four years, and we put you into the H-1B lottery. And the same is true in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and Britain to some extent. So the countries have these policies where if you have a degree from those countries, you're actually much more likely to be uh, satisfy visa requirements. And so effectively, we're rationing through that mechanism on the high end. So there's some element of that going on. And I suspect that will continue to go on. Yeah. So only rich people Well, not entirely clear. I migrated to the United States. Uh, my parents are... Uh, very modest farmers. Chinese paying thirty thousand to go to the US is a rich guy. Presumably, yes. Yeah. One last question. So if there are no more questions, um, I think we're almost at the end of the conference. My name is uh, Simon Schickelberg, and I'm the coordinator for, uh, for Aslo Zan. I'd like to thank, like to thank oh. Mr. Kord with, uh, for this excellent talk from Swiss wine. It's uh, not chocolate, not cheese, but <laughs> Switzerland also has oh, wine. Excellent, um, yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, Immigration will stay on the agenda for next weeks and uh, years to come. So I think it is important that we as social scientists, we, we are part of that debate. As think tanks, we contribute with facts um, so that we can have a healthier debate about immigration. Um, now I'd like to thank you all for coming and uh, invite you to uh, come Continue debate with a in more relaxed atmosphere with some wine.